Hey traders, David Frost, My Strategic Forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Thursday, July 8, 2021. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. What do we have on the docket today? We had a down day, pretty interesting. We haven't seen one of those in quite a while. It remains to be seen whether or not it was a garden variety down day and we resume the uptrend or was that the beginning of something else? We're going to get into the charts, and we're going to peel back the onion, we'll unpack the whole thing, and we'll come up with some ideas, some scenarios, some what-ifs that we'll be able to use going forward. We'll have some numbers in our back pocket. Let's get the big picture out of the way. What we do is take a look at the daily chart, And we like to see what's jumping off the page. Generally speaking, the first thing or two or three that hits our mind, it's the old first impressions are usually correct. So we want to do the assessment from a 30,000 foot view. Here's what I see. Forget about this line, 428.16. We'll get into exactly where that came from later. But when you pull back the curtain a little bit and say, what happened today? The market dropped. It came into an area where it filled a gap. From a shorter time frame perspective, it was a breakout area. Not necessarily the most important breakout area, but a breakout area nonetheless. The market found support in and around 428. They spiked it a little bit, but they did find stability and they began to rally. From an intraday perspective, we'll get into this later, but they did hit important numbers along the way. We're going to go over those and we'll see where they came from so that you can use that information as a learning opportunity and use that type of data going forward on your own charts. Also on the daily chart, the trend is your friend until she throws you out the window. They're still above all the moving averages. Technically speaking, nothing happened today other than a down day finishing not at, but near the highs. It's not really a bearish scenario when you look at the daily chart. By the way, how many of you noticed the title and the cover of last night's video? The cover said S&P 500 on time again. The title said S&P new highs, but on time again for a turn. The question mark, why was that? Because Time is more important than price, and we talked about it yesterday. Between today and tomorrow, the SPY was on time. Apples? Yeah, pretty slick stuff. Now, we don't know that a big down day was going to happen today, but these are awareness things. We're on the lookout for when a market or a particular chart begins to develop into a on-time scenario. You certainly don't want to be buying the market when it's on time into an up move. That would be chasing and also would result in a pie in the face. Just as a refresher, this was the cover that was on yesterday's video. Now we have the 240 minute chart and you can begin to see how the market did eat some time off the clock around that 128 price zone. There was a gap there. So you begin to get that assemblance of full stack type of information. You couple it together with a round number and all of a sudden you have an opportunity on your hands. In addition, we should notice that the first 240 minute candle from today is in fact a reversal candle. It was on heavy volume. You can see here down at the bottom, that's today's volume candle, this 240 minute candle. Came into support immediately reversed, and when I say immediately, not from a 5, 10, 15 minute chart perspective, from a 240 minute chart perspective, that's a hit and run. They immediately turned around, went back in the other direction, finishing near the highs on that candle. That is a bullish type of scenario. It also is a breakup candle. They ran a test not of the low, but down toward the low, but there's another chart where that's going to look a little bit different, you're also going to see that mentioned inside the numbers. The 120-minute chart, same thing. You can just see where they ate time off the clock and broke to the upside. So what did they do? They came back to pay a visit or run a test of a former breakout area. And oh, by the way, there happened to be a gap 
which somewhat solidifies the fact that they're going to find a reaction in the other direction under normal garden variety conditions at a spot like that. Not every time, but we use the 80-20 rule. It makes common sense. It's logical. 80% of the time, the majority of the time, that's what's going to happen. Sometimes the other thing is going to happen. And we know how to protect ourselves against the other thing. In this particular case, let's say they started closing below the gap. Let's say hourly below the gap. Well, all of a sudden that changes the picture. They're not getting the spike back or bounce back in the other direction. Closing below the gap would open the door for something else that's developing. So either way, you have to know in advance where your numbers are. When price gets there, you have to have a game plan. And you also have to know where and why you would pull the ripcord when you get into a trade or even before you get into a trade. This is how you run it as a business. Now, here's the hourly chart, and you're going to see this inside the numbers, but we're going to go over it now. So here's the breakout area. They eight time off the clock. There's a gap. They broke up. What did they do? They came back to retest or run a test of a former breakout area, fill the gap. Okay, now on the hourly chart, they put in a tail candle. It's a pseudo doji candle, as I like to call it. That's what I call it in the course, lazy e-mini trader. And by the way, everything I'm discussing here, including the stuff that I'm going to discuss over the next two or three minutes, is right out of the course, lazy e-mini trader. What I'm discussing here is the broad brush. In the course is the detail. It's the why behind everything. It's how does it work. It's what do you do, what not to do, all that stuff. So here, they put in a pseudo doji candle, they put in a tail candle. What does the next candle do? The candle ending at 11.30 a.m., this one. What does it do? It runs a retracement. How far? About half, maybe a little bit more than half. Where does that come from? Comes right out of the course, lazy e-mini trader. I'm like blue in the face already. So at that point, you have two options that are going to take place. Let's say you entered a trade at 428 or below 428. You're waiting for the market to rally. Now, here's where the light bulb is going to go on for some of you. We're looking at an hourly chart and we're saying in the second candle of the day, maybe they're running a retracement, maybe they're not. Get below the low of the first candle, start closing candles below there, five minute ones, 10 minute ones, 15 minute ones, and they're likely going lower, so that's the tell. Your line in the sand is the low on the first hourly candle of the day at that point. Now, here's what we're looking at. The left side of the screen is the same chart as the right side of the screen, only it's a five minute chart versus an hourly chart. So here's what the point I wanna get across. On the hourly chart, I'm watching to see if they're gonna do the retracement thing, and if they do, and they start getting above the high of the first candle of the day, they're going to take off. That's what will happen the majority of the time. I'm watching a shorter time frame. It doesn't matter whether it's 5 minute, 10 minute, 15 minute. And they're doing this thing back and forth near the lows. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Now somebody might think they're making a bearish pattern. They're going to fail. Somebody might think maybe they're just going to fail. I'm watching both charts and more. And I'm watching them run a retracement. I see what's going on. So I want to give it time. This is one of the reasons why I can add a visual and say, this is why you watch multiple different time frames. They're not doing the same thing on every chart you watch. For example, watch on this five minute chart what happened. Look at this candle here that ends 9.55 a.m. It's a breakup candle, right? It's a five minute chart. All charts act and react the same way. The low is 427.81. Well, guess what? They spike the low. It looks like they're going to fall into the abyss. But what happens? The closing price at 1025, when this five minute candle closes is what? 427.86, they close above the low. Then what happens? They go up again. So what did they really do? They ran a test of the low of a breakup candle. Like blue in the face already, again. This stuff happens over and over and over again. All charts act and react the same way. Isn't that pretty cool stuff? Inside the numbers, pre-market commentary, we have a happy Thursday, wake up to one of those big declines. We were always going to see one of these, we just don't know when. 
This one was on time, but you still don't know what's going to happen before it happens. Divergences, they will resolve one way or the other. Remember, over the last several days, we've been talking about divergences. The IWM, the transports, the financials. These are the reasons why we were talking about divergences. Wait until you see some of those charts in a few minutes. Volatility will expand. The swings will be wide and fast in both directions. That's an awareness. At that point in time in the morning, the media hadn't figured out why the market was down. They'll assign reasons until one or two stick. I don't know whether they did or they didn't. I stopped watching long before the market even opens for business. How did I know that they couldn't figure it out? Because when I was listening to the pundits, the talking heads, they were using terms like probably. When they use a term like probably, that translates to I have no freaking idea why the market's down. And you don't have to have an idea. That's the point that I'm always trying to get across. It doesn't matter what the reason is, or what you think the reason is, or what I think the reason is. Makes no difference. All we need to know are the numbers. This was always going to happen. You just don't know what day. And by the way, here's another thing. These are for traders that aren't familiar with trading markets that have the potential, before it even opens, to be one of those wild, big swinging days. Cash is a position, which means any trader who is uncomfortable with this type of tape can be a spectator from the box seats. There's nothing wrong with that. All right, let's keep going, see what else we've got. 8.30, what about the numbers? We've got them, but they won't show up until closer to game time, trying to minimize how much and how quickly they get passed around the interweb. Everybody knows exactly what I'm talking about, especially the idiots doing it. All right, now let's get into the numbers. What about the numbers? Well, here's what we've got on the docket. There are three primary spots of interest in the morning. Why are there three? Because we don't know exactly what's going to happen after the open, so we have to have our ducks in a row. We have to have spot number one, the intermediate spot, and then the oh no, just in case spot. We only needed one spot, so we'll focus on that and we'll focus on some other stuff. The first spot was 428, give or take. This is where they ate a bunch of time off the clock, and there's an open gap. Hmm, seems pretty important. The other two spots, 426.50, 425, they'll come into play at some other point in time in the future. Both, or maybe just one, will be important in the future. We don't necessarily know until game time. Just as a refresher, so first thing in the morning, before the market open, everybody knew, everybody who's an Inside the Numbers member knew, 428, It was actually 428.16, doesn't matter, it's close enough. 428 was the spot. Looks like a falling knife when the market opens. I get that. It's just like the stocks on the move, same routine, but it's not. They're headed to a destination. Once they get to the destination, one of two things happen. Either they run some time off the clock and they go lower because another destination was really what they were after, or they have a reaction in the other direction. And you would say, well, isn't there a third one where they cut through that number like a hot knife through butter? And the answer is no, because then the destination or the number would have been wrong. The first two are, it's an important number, it is a destination, one of two things is going to happen. There's no chance in hell that 428 is not an important number. If the market spent all day yesterday trading at 428.50, then that's different, then 428 is not important anymore. But they were nowhere near 428. So coming from new highs where they were yesterday, is 428 important? And the answer is, hell yeah. Well, and then somebody else would say, well, how do you know that a number higher wasn't the number? That's why I get paid the big bucks. 428 was your spot. Took some time, this is what it looks like on a five minute chart again, looks like an EKG down there. There's your 10, a little bit more compressed. 15, a little bit more compressed. Stay with me, there's a method to the madness. 20, 30, about a 45 minute chart. When's the last time you saw one of those? All of a sudden you have another little pseudo doji candle there. Hourly chart, and here was the point. The reason to go through that exercise so that you see with a visual how time matters. Time is more important than price. The market sometimes just needs time to do what it's doing. Here's what I mean by that. It wasn't anywhere near 428 yesterday. If 428 was to be a destination, maybe it hits it, turns around, and runs right back, and that's fine. But maybe it just needed to test it for a while, run some tests for an hour, 
or two. The longer it runs tests for, and if it trades away, it solidifies the importance of the test. Spent a lot of time down there, traded away. That's a successful test. As a trader, I would rather see them just hit and run. Just letting you inside my head how I view the markets. Let's see what else we have. You've got the majority of what happened today. It was pretty simple. They sold off, they came into the number, and they went back up. But from a real-time perspective and inside the number perspective, there's other stuff you need to know if you're trading in the market during the trading day. So we needed to know 430 was important. We needed to know 42960 was another number. You'll see that one. And another one of 43115. Let's scroll up. You can pause the video, read the notes. I definitely urge you to go back to the charts to double check the work. 947, here's 42815. Is the spot they need to recapture to produce another leg higher for traders that bought below 428. And as you can see, they're going back and forth, back and forth, but as long as they're staying above 426, 15, 16, whatever, that gap, then they're okay. After they started to rally a little bit, 428.75 was a good spot to take profit. Again, you have to take profit along the way. You don't know how high they're going to go at the time. They could have still failed. It was only 20 minutes into the day. You don't know until you know. By 9.51, nice trade, should have taken some profit. That means everybody protect the rest. What does the rest mean? The rest means you can hold a trailer. You got profit in your pocket. You're in the driver's seat, the catbird seat. 9.54, 4.29.60 is high of day. Natural area of resistance. For the visual, there it is. 4.29.60, that was the high of day early in the morning. And when they get back to it, getting above is the ticket. Closing candles above is the ticket. And guess what happened? Look at this candle here ending at 11.45. What did they do? They went back down to run a test or a retest of that same area. They get above, they run a back test on a successful test, meaning they're not getting below, they're not closing candles below. A successful test is what? They go up. What happened at the end of the day? Where did they go back to? They went right back to that same spot that we knew about from this morning. Funny how that works. Let's see what else we have. Again, pause the video and read the notes. I guarantee you're going to learn stuff if you just pay attention and understand what's being written here, what's being provided here in the way of market commentary. Here's where you know if they're doing something, then it means something else is developing. Case in point, 427.61 was low of day. So if they get below the low of day, where are they going? You need to have that number. 426.50, it was the next number on the board. If you believed in 428, then you should have believed in 426.50 and 425. They're all derived using the same system. They're not all going to be right all of the time, but most are going to be right most of the time. How do I know that? Because the numbers work. Hourly close above 428.16 is the more bullish than bearish scenario. Doesn't mean they'll run, but it's a start for the bulls. Closing below opens the door a little wider for 426.50. See what else we have. Here's a good one. We talk about this from time to time. I'm going to go back to the chart in a second, show you what I'm talking about. But for learning purposes, the test of the lows, spike of it, and recovery right before the hour closed is something they do a lot. It's bullish in the short run. So at 1030, they give us a bullish sign. This is what we're looking at. So it was near the close of the first hour of the day, 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So here's the 15-minute candle closing or ending at 10.30. So you can see they spiked the previous low by a few pennies. Why do they do that? That's where the liquidity is. What does that mean? Get out your notepad. Let's just go through a hypothetical scenario. I'm trader number A. I'm long the market. I'm long the SPY, but my stop is below the low of this candle. That at the time is the low of day. The low is 427.61. If you're trading futures, same concept. A lot of traders put their stop right below the low of the day. One tick, two ticks, three ticks, whatever. They put it right below the low of day. So I'm not the only one that knows that. And by the way, the professionals in the institutions, they have much more insight into the depth of the market than you and I do they can see the orders sitting there. 
and they don't really even have to see them personally. I'm sure they have computers that are doing all that work for them. So if in fact they have stop orders below the low of the day, that means those orders are orders of willing sellers down there. Okay, if I'm a big institutional participant, I have a big pot of cash to float around the market, I know this is going on. So if I'm able to drive price along with my buddies, all the institutions together, I'm not saying it's a conspiracy theory, I'm just saying this is a hypothetical. We drive price down below the low of day, we pick up all the stop orders, which are what? They're sell orders, we're buyers, that's liquidity, we're going to pick up all those orders, the little trader is out, he takes a loss, we pick up the business, we pick up the orders, and the market snaps back in the other direction, and we go to lunch fat, dumb, and happy. Now think about this for a minute. I'm not just making up that scenario. That is the scenario. Back to inside the numbers. I told you you're going to learn stuff if you just pay attention. There's a couple of other things that I want to point out of interest in the notes section of inside the numbers. By the way, there's no stocks on the move today. The market didn't go down enough earlier, the stocks didn't go down enough early to get to the numbers that I selected. Why is that? Well, when you have a market that is getting hit hard before the opening bell, we don't know exactly what's going to happen to the stocks and across the whole market, so I have to err on the side of caution, and I pick numbers that seem like they're far away, but we all know the routine they get hit at some point, and on days like this, sometimes we come out of it with six, seven trades under our belt. You never know. Let me keep going because it was the afternoon that I wanted to point something out important. Well, actually, it's here in the state of the tape. Here's the current state of the tape, 1121. Staying above 429.60 keeps the bulls in charge. Remember, that was the old high from this morning. Once they got above, they ran the back test. So here's the same number. Staying above keeps the bulls in charge. 430 is some natural resistance. If they can get above 430.50 or higher, another spot, 431.15. And there you have it. 431.15 was a spot. You can see what happened. They ran right up to it, and that was the stopping point. That tells us that it was a bona fide number. Now, just because they went through it doesn't mean the number wasn't important. We know it's important because they got right to it, and they stopped. And once they stop, we know that it is a bona fide resistance point. Doesn't mean they can't keep going, but if they run up to it and stop, then you know your number's correct. And then the general area, you can see, they spent some time up here, got a little bit above, and then they fell away. So that was definitely an important spot. You have to know your numbers. You have to know your numbers for entries. You have to know your numbers for exits. You just have to know your freaking numbers. Getting back inside or below 428.95 and closing candles down there is the bearish scenario going forward. Therefore, 428.95 is our lunchtime and afternoon pivot. Now, they didn't quite get down there at the end of the day, but just for visual purposes, look at this. They almost did it right at the end of the day, 428.95. They came up short and then they rallied away, but they almost went down to run a test of that spot. Moving along, see what else we have. Again, you've got all the numbers. We looked at the chart ad nauseum. So what I'm going to do from here is just let you read the notes. Pause the video. Do it at your own leisure. Double check the work. All I can say is if you're flying blind and you're guessing at trades, then this is a no-brainer. You're going to lose more per trade than this thing costs per month inside the numbers. Tell me you're not doing that now. What's going on over in camp IWM. So they went down again, and we're talking about this low. Wasn't that the spot that we had to worry about? So if they gave up that spot on a closing basis, then certainly we could see a lot more selling. Not necessarily immediately, but that really opens the door. That low is 221.13. There it is from a visual perspective. Here it is on a short duration chart, a 15-minute chart. Do you think the market knew about 221.13, and there was a conscious decision to close above it. And the answer is, there are no accidents nor coincidences in the market. Okay, so what do we do with that information? Well, you have to look at it like this. A, 
the IWM still, my favorite market leading indicator, was certainly leading to the downside. There's no two ways about it. And I'm not just talking about today. It was down and other markets were up. We talk about it day in, day out. But they were rescued. So you could see them try to rally back to get into or inside of these moving averages. That's certainly in the cards, not out of the question. It's one step at a time type of market. Remember, we're in a bullish market overall. When you look at the long-term trends, the trend is up, so therefore the draw or the dominant thing is still up. The magnetic force is up in the northern direction to the North Pole. Net, net, no two ways about it, 221.13 was important. Now, we go to the weekly chart, and we'll be interested in this chart after Friday's close. Where do we close? Let's say they close above the low of this breakup candle, 223.28. What does that tell you? That tells you nothing happened all week long. It was just a little bit of a down day or two in the IWM or three or whatever it was, and... In that scenario, they would still be above all the moving averages on the weekly chart, above that breakup candle low, and that would not be a bearish development, at least from that standpoint. They give up that one, we're looking at the next one, the same one we've been talking about for quite a while. Net net, pretty good rescue operation in the IWM today. What about the folks down at the transportation department? We've been talking about this one. I think we had this one lock, stock, and barrel from several weeks ago. My second favorite market leading indicator, a number one canary in the coal mine. So they've been riding the 100 period moving average. Today they give it up. Okay, fair enough. The weekly chart, they were for a couple, three weeks riding the 20 week moving average. Now they're giving, not gave, giving it up. We don't know where they're going to close at the end of the week, but if they close below it, it's another sign. It's another tell. Doesn't even matter if the S&P 500 and the Dow are up. If this thing closes the week below the 20-week moving average, unless they do a quick turnaround the following week, they're telling you something. That's why I call it a canary in the coal mine. Not every market is going to roll over at the same time. It's a process. That's why we have favorite market leading indicators. Isn't it ironic that the two favorite market leading indicators were down and down and down while the S&P 500 was up and up and up. These things are no accidents or coincidences. I watch these things for a reason. What about the folks out in Silicon Valley, the Q people? Down half of 1%, it's nothing. At the end of the day, nothing happened. They came down, filled the gap, they did eat some time off the clock over here. Same routine as the SPY. All they did was run a test. This thing is bullish until and unless it changes character. They have to get below at minimum of the daily chart 20 period moving average even to get somebody's attention. They will, it's just a matter of when. The financials, the XLF, another one we had lock, stock, and barrel. You had the move down, you had the bearish wedgish thing into the convergence of moving averages, not quite to the top of the breakdown candle high, and what happened? They sold off not below the low. So technically, we could be in a higher low scenario until and unless they come below this low and close the day below it. That low is 35.18. Tomorrow's Friday. We could get a Friday float. They could spark, goose, jam the markets up on a Friday. They can do anything. Don't discount anything. Smash Mouth. Woodshed day on Smash Mouth. It was down more earlier, but still finished down 1.5% right below on a gap down below the 20 period moving average, rallied back to run a test, couldn't get above it, and that's where we are. So therefore, from a daily chart perspective, they did crack the code a little bit. From a weekly chart perspective, until and unless they come below the 20 week moving average, then they're still in an uptrend. The trend is your friend until she tosses you out. Have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you? Without you, these videos are not possible. True and accurate information. We're going to pull the ripcord here today. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.